Hi, this is Schieffer's Magic Alcove and I am Schieffer Bradigan. So last week when I talked to you, I told you about that blue unknown spider web thing that was above my bed and how the face said I had made it. Since then, after talking about it enough, I remembered it. And they were right, I did make it. Apparently this was part of a protection thing that I did around my bed. Um, I had, I'm still not sure exactly who, someone was sending a, a rather aggressive uh, wolf or dog form with growls and bearing teeth at me uh, a number of years ago. And at the time, I, after the, it happened several times, I decided I really needed to be able to catch it or keep it from getting in. So I created this sticky web idea um, and put it on the astral and the mental plane so that if this form came at me again it would get stuck. And interestingly enough about two days after I saw that thing last week um, the thing came back. A weaker form of it. I was getting ready to go to sleep and then all of a sudden BAM there's growling thing sort of with teeth bared racing at me and I put my hand up and caught it and without thinking <laughs> I sent it back which wherever it came from so I still don't know who was doing it but that's fine the universe knows and they'll figure that out and to catch you up on what I've been up to before I get started on today's subject um, I've been making more wands and so I'm this is one of the ones that I've made recently, and this is an apple wand with a nice amethyst point on it. All of these will be up on the Etsy site later today. And then I made this one, which is an alder wand with a nice tiger eye. I added a tiger eye at the bottom of it, so it'd be good for protection uh, kind of things. Everyone's going to have their own idea of what things are good for, too, so what suits you may not suit others. And this is another piece of alder. Apparently I lost its tag somewhere. Um, and this has a uh, yellow jasper top on it. Then I made this little guy, which was tricky to try and get a point on the end of it. But this one is also alder with a clear crystal. And I might add some stones at the bottom, I haven't decided. And then this one is a little short little wand. And uh, this is a roadie with a quartz crystal on the top. So those are the ones I made for sale. And this is the one I made for me. <laughs> I like fancy things, what can I say? I, I liked this piece of alder wood. This is a piece of alder because it was all black and old and and whatnot. And I turned this into a Saturnian wand. So I've got three for the number of Saturn. And I've got uh, black obsidian, black tourmaline, and black spinel on there. So three different black stones. Uh, and one of the, I have these in opposite spirals. So I have a spiral of black tourmaline going in this direction spinel is going in this direction. I haven't charged it up yet. But, you know, working on it when you when you make your own wands, thinking about what it is you're wanting to do with it and what its purpose is, gets it to start taking on that uh, characteristic. So that's my brief high catching up on my week. So today I think I'd like to talk about um, what it's like to have your abilities or gifts, depending on what they are in any event, suddenly awaken and how confusing and frightening that can be. And of course, I can only speak from my own personal experience being born when I was in like 1950, uh, as I grew up and started to have unusual and experiences. I had no one to talk to about them, and there were no books to read. There was no communication with other people. We were pretty isolated, we lived on a Navy base. My father was in the Navy. 
but it helps to hear that other people have had similar experiences because it, it gives you some sort of a, um, an idea that first you're not alone, that it isn't just you, you're not completely crazy, uh, and you're not like the only one on the planet that's having these things happen to you. When I was a kid, that's kind of what I thought because there was no communication and the subject matter wasn't one that was spoken of. My mom tried her best to accept me for who I was, uh, but she didn't have any skills or understanding of what was going on with me. And the most uh, helpful thing she could think of to say was, go to bed, go to sleep, and everything will be fine in the morning. And of course, that doesn't always work. Yes, things might have a different perspective in the morning, but it doesn't mean what happened the night before is not there anymore. So I know that I started having experiences before, and some of my earlier experiences I don't really remember consciously at this point, except I remember knowing about two different past lives. That's sort of always been there. That's been a, a constant memory from the time I have memory. So I always knew that I had been here before, and this wasn't my first time. One of the memories I had was of being burned as a witch, and the other was of a place where auras were visible, colors were visible, uh, things were very different, completely different, like hard to describe kind of different. And I think that they were sort of to balance each other out, where the one was a warning about what can happen when people don't understand what's going on and they see you as different. The other was a hopeful kind of thing that there is this beauty and wonder that's available out there and I have experienced it before, so maybe I can experience it again. But that's just me trying to make sense out of it. Just because we try to make sense out of something and it seems to fit our experience doesn't mean that that's the correct answer or that there is a correct answer. A lot of times there's no way to really know. You just do your best to try and understand it. So right from the start, because of my um, abilities, I apparently, I didn't quite speak in tongues. I quoted <laughs> from the Bible when I was four years old, and I don't remember this at all. And apparently I used revelations quite a bit, which freaked out the neighbors. So they weren't very happy about me being around. Um, I did things and knew things that a child of my age shouldn't know. And that is a common reaction that people have. If it's something they can't comprehend, something they can't connect to because they've never experienced it before, it's completely outside of what they consider normal range of human abilities, uh, most often they're going to be afraid of it. And so they were afraid of me because I represented that and I didn't understand it because I was just being myself. And I had a lot of, of little things, I guess, well, I don't know, not little things. I saw a lot of spirit beings when I was a kid. So I would go out in the woods and I spent a fair amount of time in the woods and I would see angelic forms or what I would call angels because they had wings and they were pretty and colorful and sparkly like angels were supposed to be according to the church I was being raised in. And I would see other spirits like uh, tree spirits, uh, nature spirits. So I'm assuming that that's what, you know, that that's what those were. I just sort of accepted them. They were part of my environment. I did not question that they were there. And the first time I consciously remember, or I consciously understood that I was different from everyone else was in the first grade. And I was looking out the window and I see energy a lot. And like trees have got sparks coming off of them. The air has sparks flying through it. Some of them may be spirits, some of them might be um, just energy forms or expressions of energy or auras or whatever. I don't have a way of knowing for sure what was what. But I was looking out the window and I saw all these lights and they were flying through the air and above the trees out in the horizon. And people had started talking about UFOs. I'd heard rumors about like alien spaceships and things and I wondered if maybe these were some of those. And I mentioned them you know, to my fellow classmates and pointed at them out the window and I look at the lights 
and they all looked at me and said, there are no lights, what are you talking about? And that was the moment that it sort of solidified in my head, and I knew I saw things that they didn't, and that meant I was different from them, and I didn't want to be. We have a desire to conform, to fit into patterns, to not make waves, especially when we're kids, we want to be accepted into a group, and uh, so I s attempted to suppress my ability to see things, and uh, it's unfortunate because I may be able to see even more now if that wasn't the case, but hey, it's, you know, survival tactics, that's what they are. And so I, I started trying to suppress that kind of stuff. <clears throat> With someone like me, that doesn't work anyway, so, oh well, but I tried. And when I reached puberty is probably when everything went crazy. And this is not uncommon either, because your body is changing, hormones are shifting, uh, all these new feelings and emotions are flooding through the physical body that you happen to be in, and awakening psychic abilities at that point in time is a fairly common occurrence from what I can glean anyway. And so at that stage, premonitions was, that was the main thing that I had were premonitions. And I had a lot of them. And every time I had a premonition, I told my mother, I, I had this uh, almost uh, psychopathic need to confess <laughs> to people what's going on. I'm an announcer, I declare what's happening. And my mother was the first person who had to uh, figure out how to deal with that. <clears throat> and so the premonitions, not all of them were like huge, but all of them were intense. And the one that really stood out for me that was very confusing at that age especially was uh, I was standing at the kitchen sink and we were doing dishes. This is my memory of it. Everyone else has a slightly different memory of what happened, which is normal. But, you know, doing the dishes with my brother and sister and, you know, doing the little typical kind of bickering. People are giving me dishes back saying they're not clean and I'm looking at them. What do you mean it's not clean? I can, and then I'm finding a spot and I'm putting it back in the water, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So I'm just totally focused on the task at hand and kind of slightly miffed. And done with the dishes and the water was swirling down the sink. And as it started swirling down the sink, it made this funny sound all of a sudden. I mean, it wasn't a normal water going down the sink noise. It turned into this giant, what I figured out later was a crashing sound. I'd never really heard metal crunch before um, in the, at that point. So I didn't recognize what it was, but it was a very distinctive and very intense. And all of a sudden, it popped into my head, it's going to happen at 9.30. And the other part of me is like, what's going to happen at 9.30? I don't know, but it's going to happen at 9.30. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm like, what do I do? And I remember sitting in my mother's bathroom, because she had this big mirror kind of thing, and standing in front of this mirror, uh, looking at myself and trying to understand why did I know that something was going to happen to someone I couldn't talk to, I couldn't tell them, I couldn't warn them, um, what was the purpose of this, and that's that human need to try and make sense out of things and to put it into a narrative that works, except there isn't one. There's no way to understand it, it just happened. And of course, you know, telling my mother it's going to happen at 9:30, and she's like, you know, go to bed and go to sleep, and everything will be right, all right, in the morning. And I'm like, I can't go to bed before 9:30. It's like this isn't my bedtime. I was in high school, so I must have been, what, 14, maybe 15, somewhere in there. Um, and so when the I was like obsessed, this voice kept saying 9.30, 9.30, and at 9.27 I walked out of my house. <laughs> I just couldn't keep, I couldn't stay inside anymore. I had to be outside at 9.30 when whatever it was happened. And I walked outside and into the front, like in, at the road like level, like behind, the, you know, down the driveway sort of thing, and just stood there and looked up and down the street and wondered you know, 
what's going to happen at 930. And then I heard and saw the crash. It was a small convertible, like a you know sports car kind of thing. And all of a sudden, these lights, I could see the lights on the road through the trees, and the lights went straight up in the air as it hit a telephone pole and um, crashed, and the sound came. And I heard the sound I had heard when I was doing the dishes. And it was loud enough because it was at night and very still and quiet. My mother was running out of the house because she heard the crash, and she thought that I had had a, had a premonition about my own death, and she was going to find my lifeless body there at the end of the driveway. And uh, and then the siren started almost immediately. It was like, you know, very condensed, I guess. And I don't know if that was because it was so shocking uh, to me, or if it really was that fast. Because again, the brain does strange things, especially when you're having some kind of an intense event where time can either extend out and be really, really long, like a few seconds is like minutes for you to figure out what to do, or it can compress itself and everything kind of falls in on top of each other. So there's no real way for me to know. And uh, my memory of what happened after that diverges dramatically from my mother's memory of it. She remembers taking me to the scene of the accident and confirming everything I told her. I told her the number of people that were in the vehicle and all this other stuff. I don't remember that. That could be a survival tactic or safety mechanism, or my mother thought that's what she had done because I told her what I saw, and in her head, that's what it became. Again, you don't always know for sure what is really going on when it comes to that kind of stuff. But it was, an, it, you know, one of those moments that um, stood out because it had me asking those kinds of questions, like the question of why, why me, why do I have to know? And the answer to that is there's no way to answer that. There's no way to satisfy that human need for purpose and, and ba not balance, but uh, sensibility you know, a, a, a narrative, a thread of a story that puts everything into perspective and you can see like before that and after that and this is what this was for. There really isn't a way of doing that. I think that is the reason why when people survive uh, traumatic events uh, where lots of other people die, uh, often they decide in order to make it okay that they're not dead with everyone else, they have to have some kind of a significant purpose that they now follow. And that is to create that scenario or that narrative in themselves where it now will make sense in the greater picture. Like this great sacrifice happened in order for, for me, you know, from that, I will now go out and help all these other people. And depending on their religion or spiritual beliefs, it's going to, it's going to frame itself in very specific ways because that's what we do. We use our experiences and our beliefs in order to try and frame reality around us. So I had a fair number of those and everyone I had, I told my mother, and everyone I had happened. So by the time I needed to tell my mother that my father was going to come after her one of the last nights that we were there before we left, uh, she listened to me. So that was the narrative I came up with, was that these things that happened served to show my mother that when I said something was going to happen, it was going to happen. So when the time came to save our lives, she would believe me. And she did. And uh, so, you know, it was, it's, it's interesting. And then after leaving home, uh, part of also what was happening to me was being an empath. And being an empath is sort of a specialized ability. I mean, hopefully everyone has empathy, which is the ability to connect with other people, to imagine what it would be like if you were them, how it would feel to you as a human being. And, and so, you know, then you have some compassion for what they're likely going through. Sociopaths don't have that, but ordinary people have some level of empathy, because that's one of the things that makes us human. An empath, on the other hand, is sort of an ex, uh, accentuated, accelerated, uh, 
popped up version of that. <clears throat> and I was rem reminded this week in a conversation with someone that uh, one of the symptoms, I guess you could say, of an empath who hasn't gotten control of their abilities yet and hasn't worked through all that, which I certainly was at that point, is the ability to uh, adapt your energy and even your physical form to suit the people that are around you. And I did that a lot. I would walk into a room, I would feel whatever I was feeling, I would try and sense what it was that people were looking for, expecting, and I would conform myself to that shape um, and uh, to make them comfortable and to keep me safe. It's also a survival tactic from all the abuse and stuff that I had. So if you're at the stage where you don't know who you are and someone else says that your face keeps changing shape when you're making love or having an intense conversation or whatever, that's probably what's going on is that you're an empath and you are attempting to change yourself to suit the circumstances and the other person, which can be interesting and in short bursts useful as far as gathering information goes but in the long term, bad for you. Because that's not the point. We're supposed to be here trying to become ourselves and figure out what that is, and to gain some control over our abilities. So if that's happened to you or something similar, again, you're not alone. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons I put up a lot of the uh, exercises that I did to help with that. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, sacred tree meditation, and also the, the, the cup, uh, charging up the cup and putting the things in that you want to let go of, transforming them and bring them back in so that you can decide what kind of a person you want to be. But there is no way to avoid uh, confusion and anxiety and sometimes fear when these things happen because they're still not that common. And we have more communication with other people who are different, which is great. You have more books available, people who write about their experiences or, or you know, give out exercises, which I didn't have at all. I had to try and figure it all out on my own, mostly, or from science fiction novels that gave me a notion of how to control my telepathy or my psychic abilities of various kinds. Uh, but having books isn't necessarily as helpful as one would hope because it's still up to you as the person who's experiencing it to navigate your own internal um, environment, landscape, uh, and figure out what works for you. So all the things that worked for me may not work for you and the things that worked for you may not work for me. So one of the problems I also had was being able to hear other people's thoughts. That's a little bit beyond just being an empath. I'm also a telepath. And I would have to move because I didn't know how to block other people's thoughts and you know have them stay out of their heads. I didn't want to be in their heads, but I couldn't figure out how to stay out of their heads because the information was just all there, easy to see for me. And I would live in a place for a little over a year usually and then it would start to push in on me. So it would take me a while to tune in to the neighborhood and the people who live there and adapt to my environment. And at that point, I would start to hear their thoughts and, and hear their secrets and hear their arguments and all this other stuff. And I have many moments where I remember things like that, walking down the street in my neighborhood, looking at a house, and like, bam, there's all that information right there. And looking at another house, bam, there's all this other information right there. It's like every single place I knew all of that stuff and I just couldn't cope and then I'd move. So that was my survival tactic for that phase is moving. And you know, there's, I've gone through lots of different stages, of course, because I've been around long enough and survived long enough to be able to um, incorporate some of the stuff that I've survived into a form that I can use in order to maintain sanity and my connection with the regular world. But, you know, it's, it's there. There's that. 
uh, at least now I have shields. I can shield myself from other people's thoughts. I can uh, control what I get from them, decide when it's going to happen unless I accidentally think I'm safe when I'm not, <laughs> which has happened a couple of times. Um, and, and it's a, I, th I believe still, I think that a lot of this was part of my survival tactic. Uh, it was an approach to help me survive my childhood because if I wasn't able to see all that stuff and sense things coming, I probably would have ended up dead and in a literal sense. And uh, so it's a theory at any rate that in the distant past when we were not as civilized as we seem to be now, that uh, people who survived had that ability to communicate over long distances. You see it in animals in their, their tribe kind of stuff where the birds all turn together or the crows are able to tell their descendants, the, the people in the community that are good to them and the ones that are bad for them, even after that person hasn't been around, they'll remember them for a long time. So, you, you know, and, and now we know that trees communicate with each other too over fairly long distances through the ground, uh, through the mycelium and, and funguses and things like that that travel through the earth from one tree to another. And so this is something that exists in nature and um, we have sort of stepped back from it, or gotten lost from it, uh, confused ourselves about it, put ourselves into sort of micro universes that are separated from all of this. And to me, part of paganism and part of being pagan, whether you're a witch or a druid or whatever your persuasion might be, is to open ourselves up to those other forms of consciousness and intelligence and allowing them to start interacting with us like they probably have been all along, but we just haven't been receptive to it. So with all of that being said, one of the probably most important things I've learned about this kind of thing is to follow your inner voice and follow your intuition. If you have a voice in your head that says, don't do that, there's usually a reason. Sometimes it's like a made up reason in your own subconscious, but as you meditate and you get to know yourself more completely, then you're better able to separate out those different kinds of voices from your own subconscious and anxieties and fears to your inner guide or you know um, an external spirit or God or goddess that's trying to assist you or other forms of consciousness in nature like trees and stones and, and animals and that kind of thing. Then for me the trick has been to tr not, not trying to make them fit into some preconceived notion that human beings have come up with about reality and how it works. I believe in science. I think science is awesome. But I also think that um, as a culture, as different cultures, we shortchange ourselves on the possibilities that might express themselves to us by trying to put people and things and experiences into specific boxes to make us feel, you know, make us feel comfortable. If we have a identifier, a definition, and a place for something, then we feel more comfortable. And living on the edge of the unknown is definitely not comfortable. <laughs> you never know what is going to happen. Things happen spontaneously and often without any warning whatsoever. But when you open yourself up to those things, then you never know. It can be the most exciting and most wondrous thing you've ever had. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I'm hoping that sharing some of those experiences with you helps you to understand that you are not alone and that it is a process. People who are great at piano or great at art or great at any other thing, they get better with practice. And this is the same thing. You get better with practice. You try things, they work, they don't work. They don't work, you try something different because there are always some things out there that will work. And each one of us is such a unique individual 
um, and our experience of the universe is uniquely our own. So if I ever say anything that makes you think I think other people are stupid, well, I have my opinions. <laughs> I might think some people are stupid, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a right to be who they are. Um, but mostly it's just, it's in our shared encounters and shared experiences that we begin to understand one another. And so if you resonate with the experiences, you'll get something out of it. And if you don't, you probably think I'm a wacky person <laughs> out of my mind, which we'll talk about on another video because <laughs> I have been out of my mind before. So um, doing things, even though you're afraid to do them, doesn't mean you're doing things wrong because some of the things I knew had to be done for the things I were most afraid of doing. And the reason I was afraid was because I knew it would change me and alter me in a fundamental way that I could not predict. And once I was changed by whatever it was, I could never go back. Once the door is open and I've walked through it and learned something, it's there forever. I understand some people have the ability to shut those doors and go back to where they were before, which I'm always astonished and amazed at, <laughs> but I'm not built that way. So hopefully this has been a little bit of help. And again, if you have any questions and if you want me to cover specific subjects, please let me know, send me a comment and you'll see the link to the, um, the Etsy shop where the wands will be up on in the comments at the bottom of the video. So. This has been Shifra Bradigan, and this has been Shifra's Magic Alcove. Blessed be.